Good morning. Welcome to worship as we continue in our Pentecost worship series, God's Word Possesses God's Power. Through God's Word, Christ creates the miracle of committed followers. We rejoice together as we begin our worship this morning with our first hymn, Hymn 7. Our sermon text this morning from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62, printed again on page 10 in your worship folder so you can follow along. Dear Christian friends, I am rather a fair weather sports fan. I always have been. Coming from Wisconsin, I can enjoy a Packers game, a Brewers game, a Badgers game, but I'm not a diehard fan. I don't know the names of all the players or even how their seasons have been going. I am amazed at those who seem to know every single detail, can even picture where they were on a particular day when a specific play was made. Those are people worthy of being called fans. (laughs) Maybe not so much me. Are we merely fair weather fans of Jesus? Are we merely interested in him when it seems to bring some immediate benefit to our lives or when it fits with the people that are around us on a given day? Even if you could say that we are actual fans of Jesus, is that even what he's looking for? Fans? In our first lesson, our final lesson this morning, Jesus is going to make the point in a very strong way that he wants us to follow him completely. He has not called us to be fair weather fans. He's not just going to say this is what he would like, but he resolutely moves to Jerusalem. And as he is going there, he moves us more and more to see that the only way to follow him is completely. Let us hear again, starting with verse 51. We read, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. You know, being zealous for the Lord is not a bad thing. In fact, it was prophesied about Jesus that he would be zealous for the house of the Lord, that that zeal would even consume him. He would be 100% about his father's will. But here, as the disciples pass a particular Samaritan village, they meet flat-out unbelief. What was the response of Jesus' sons of thunder, James and John? Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to destroy them? You have to remember that just before this, Jesus shone in glory on that mountaintop where he was transfigured before them and how the disciples wanted that glory and that power and that might to stay. They wanted it now. They wanted to to remain in it, remember? Peter said, let's make some shelters for for all of us and then we can can stay here in the presence of your glory. He wanted to remain there. The disciples continued to want to see that glory. They wanted to follow him when it looked that way. They were zealous to follow him in a glorious-looking march of victory. How is your zeal when it comes to following Jesus in this world? It is a lot easier to follow Jesus when it looks glorious. But what about when it doesn't? What about when hardly 
anyone comes. What about the times when you share your faith and no one seems to care? What about when your spouse or your child or your parents don't share your faith? They don't want to hear about him along with you. What about then? Here, Jesus rebukes James and John. Jesus wants us to know that following him in this world is not easy. It's not going to be a blaze of glory. It is instead more like taking up a humiliating cross. When no one listens, we are tempted to keep God's word to ourselves. We lose our zeal so quickly. When the world hates us for following Jesus, our knee-jerk reaction is to hate them back. But Jesus calls us to keep on going resolutely to that next village, that next person, and the next, and the next, and the next, until the day that he calls us home. We might be zero and ten for what we would consider successes in this. But our zeal for his kingdom to come to the hearts of still more people is not to fade. How is your zeal for Jesus when following him does not look glorious? You know, when we advertise vacation Bible school here, we always try to remember to say somewhere that it is free. We don't want cost to be a hindrance. And yet, what we intentionally share with these children and their parents has the potential to cost them absolutely everything in this life. Secondly, Jesus teaches us to count the cost when it comes to following him. We read again from verse 57. It says, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Essentially, he is asking them, do you know what you're getting into? Do you know what it may cost you in this life as you follow me? This can happen for Jesus' disciples too. We're optimistic about following him. We're so thankful for all that he has done for us. He really has given us absolutely everything, but then the reality sets in that following him is going to cost something sometimes. Once in an interview with Bono, the lead singer of the rock band U2, he said, following this Christ guy around is really annoying because it's really demanding of your life. (laughs) Now, he he wasn't saying that he was sick of following Jesus. He was simply claiming that the love of Jesus was his motivation to do many of the humanitarian things that he did. Now, I don't know what Bono believes today, but at the time, he expressed very well the very real tension that we face as Christians who are both saints and sinners. Jesus' love gives us everything, salvation from sin and death and hell, peace with God, eternal life. But that same inexpressible love moves us to think and speak and act in ways that our sinful nature just hates and does not find to be pleasant. It finds them even to be demanding and annoying. What, you mean following Jesus is going to affect the way that I spend my time? Yeah, it might. You mean it's going to lead me to to gather together with and encourage other believers and set time aside to do that and make that a priority? Yeah. You mean it's going to lead me to teach my kids about God and read his word to them and instruct them and not just drop them off at Sunday school or catechism class? but to teach them with my words and my life? Yeah. 
You mean it's, it's going to lead me to extend forgiveness to those who have wronged me seven times, 70 times? It's going to lead me to part with my, my money? It's going gonna, it's gonna to lead me to open up my home to others? It's going to lead me to discover my gifts and fine-tune them and put them to work serving other people? You mean it's going to lead me to sacrifice my own wants and needs in order to serve other people who might never be able to give me anything in return? What? Yeah. His love does that, doesn't it? Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Think of how humbling it was for the creator of the world to be born in a stable and placed on a bed of straw. He created the world, but had to rely upon created beings for every bodily need in life. He let go of everything that was rightfully his in order to come here and save us. So following Jesus means directing our zeal. It means counting the cost. And it also means understanding the urgency of his call. And this is probably one of the toughest things yet. In verse 59, we hear, He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is not advocating that we dishonor our parents. In fact, he called the Pharisees out for making laws that allowed them to dishonor their parents even while they were still alive. But here, Jesus, in a very forceful way, is saying that following him takes precedence even over good things. The story of Mary and Martha is a great example of this. The two sisters were both doing good things. But Mary chose the one that was the most important. Sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to his word was more important than getting everything ready for a supper in his honor. The point is that if anything, good or bad, should interfere with wholeheartedly following Jesus, then we are to let go of it and to follow him, to proclaim his word. And yeah, this might even lead family and friends to despise you. Is brunch with my family and friends more important than growing in God's words so that I can talk about my faith with more confidence? Is having my house absolutely perfect before I even consider having anyone over really more important than just getting to know them so that eventually I can share Jesus with them? Jesus says nothing is more important than the gospel. This is urgent. It is not an excuse not to love others, but it is to be our greatest priority. In fact, only when it is our greatest priority can we actually love another person. Finally, following Jesus means no turning back. He says in verse 61, Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. All of you who have ever planted crops before know that you can't plant a straight line if you're always looking somewhere else. Your lines are going to be all over the place. Right? You set your eyes on a point ahead, and you keep your hands steady on that wheel until you reach your goal. As Jesus' disciples, following him completely means no looking back. There's no looking back and saying, man, the things I could have accomplished in this life if I weren't a Christian, <laughs> or if I were just a little bit more loose about holding on to all of God's word, if I just, if I just ignored this over here, man, 
I could connect with this person so much better. Okay? So following Jesus completely means directing our zeal, counting the cost, understanding the urgency of his call, and it means no turning back. So raise your hand if you've done all of this. Yeah. Me neither. Me neither. I know I have failed at this time and again. And I know that you have too. Not only is our zeal oftentimes misguided, it's missing altogether. Not only do we fail to count the cost, we get angry and annoyed when following Jesus becomes even slightly inconvenient to our lives. Instead of acting on the urgency of Jesus' call to share the gospel, we make absolutely everything and anything other than God's word more urgent. We live as though we have to pack the most experiences and things into our short lives here as possible before it's too late. As though we completely forgot what is coming and what he is bringing us to and what he has done. Instead of fixing our eyes on our eternal heavenly goal, our paths through this life are often crooked and lopsided and meandering all over the place, looking back, longing for the comforts of this world and all the things that only pass away. So what are we to do? What are we to do when we realize that we have not followed Jesus completely? That we haven't even come close to following him completely? Well, let me bring you back to the very beginning of this lesson. What is Jesus doing again? Where is he going? He set out for Jerusalem. He's resolute that he's going to Jerusalem, and he's not going there for a vacation. He's going there to lay down his life for you and me and everyone who in themselves has no power to follow him completely or even at all. He was setting out to give up everything, to give himself up completely for you and me. Do you want to follow Jesus completely? Then follow him to Jerusalem and see what he would do for you there. See the zeal for the Lord that led him to shed his blood and lay down his life to pay for all of our lack of zeal. See him there cover the cost of all of our debt of sin that we could never pay. See him there taking care of the world's most urgent problem of sin and death and hell. See him there in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood, praying for you, and then never looking back so that lifted up on a cross, he would give himself completely for you. Friends, there, your sins were paid for completely because Jesus gave himself completely for you. Lord God, you've made us more than fans but you've even made us your dearly loved children. What is left? Lord, we belong to you. Use us to your glory. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.